David Fowley of Keeping It Real. Welcome back. Uh, I feel like I should be do, in, introducing in my best Australian accent, but that also happens to be my worst Australian accent. So I'm not going to embarrass either of us Froggy. unless you want to go for it. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> talking about talking about embarrassing. Um, we're, we're here to discuss a movie called Fair Game, which is an example of what's called Ozploitation. It's Australian exploitation films. Mm -hmm. And this movie is it got a limited theatrical re-release this past Friday. And as of by the time people are seeing this, as of yesterday, as of July 12th, 2022, it's going to be on VOD via Dark Star Films. Sorry. Um, and I don't know how this is a cult classic. It's being hailed as Tarantino's inspiration for Death Proof, which I can definitely see. And I can definitely understand that he took the inspiration he got from this movie and made a good film. Um, wow. I, I've never been bored watching an exploitation film, but I was, I was clawing the walls with this one. So we're going to talk about it. We're also going to talk about a movie that you turned me on to, which as my savior, uh, the, the, the pool of water in the oasis desert of boredom, uh, you recommended a documentary about Ozploitation, which came out in 2008. We're going to talk about that um, and how this movie does not belong anywhere near that documentary, and yet it's featured in the documentary. So, David, how are you doing, first of all? Doing all right. I'm doing good. I am uh, doing much better than this supposed cult classic um yeah i mean if, if anything i think um what this what what this aussie film uh b movie c movie um kind of solidifies is we shouldn't we should we should take uh quentin tarantino's overhype with a grain of salt a grain of sand <laughs> well very much so um and he appears in that documentary, uh, yeah. not quite Hollywood. And I guess we'll get into that later. But mm -hmm. it's it freaked me out because watching that doc, there are so many movies that I've never heard of. Yeah. In all different kinds of like exploitation subgenres, from like sex comedies to you know martial arts movies to slasher films, and they all look amazing. Mm -hmm. The problem is they introduce fair game at the very end because I kind of go chronologically through the seventies yeah. up to the eighties, like, like sex horror action, I think. Something right. Like that. Which yeah. would be another great title for a documentary, but mm -hmm. they also make fair game look amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Through well, selective editing and, and, you know, yeah, hype man Tarantino. So I'm wondering, are all these other movies terrible? I, I have a hard time imagining, but you know, it's, it was a strange sensation. I, I mean, I could see how this, it's not an original movie. It's not. Um, it, it's it's not a movie that has a great screenplay. It is basically all just designed for, um, I guess, titillation. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, I think that you could see how a lot of other movies. I wouldn't say it's um, influential, but you could see how a lot of other movies were kind of not necessarily inspired of inspired by it but doing um what this movie is doing but much better like i i think automatically of the uh i guess french action horror film that came out not too long ago a revenge um, yeah which yeah. was fantastic this that reminded me a lot of or this reminded me a lot of that uh of course revenge came after uh, but it's just so much better. I mean, uh, as far as characters and everything. Um, yeah, this you could definitely tell that like this is trying to maybe capitalize on maybe the popularity of Mad Max movies and George, what George Miller was doing. Um, but it it just it's it's just too unintentionally laughable. Um, and as as we. <laughs> went back and forth on Facebook. It has probably one of the worst soundtracks, uh, the most distracting and, and just so uh, it's like, the, it's a soundtrack from a, from a, for a totally different movie uh, or a TV show or a video game. I don't know. It, it's just, it's really bad. 
there's a moment where our main character I, I've got to get I, I get the actress and, and her character Jessica. In mixed. yeah Jessica played by Cassandra Delaney mm -hmm. um, there's a moment where she's being terrorized or freaked out and there's like this jump scare cue on the soundtrack yeah and she reacts to it but there's nothing actually scary happening in the scene so it's as if she's reacting to the music <laughs> which yeah i mean it's very odd it's one of those movies that you, you you hope that it's so bad it's good but it's just not and you wonder like man the stories behind the making of this movie have to be better than you know what we're getting and and I, i'm wondering it's like you almost feel like there's a boom box with the tape with tape in the boom box and he's the director's playing that that score you know <laughs> on the set um the, you know this is directed by mario uh, andrea andriaccio uh and i'm not familiar with uh a lot of his other work but it, it seems like this was his first like um feature film before that it was all like documentary shorts yeah, primarily mm. documentary shorts, documentary documentaries for TV, TV uh, specials. So I don't know, you know, how he was plucked for this, or you know, w what about this, you know, draw drew him to uh, the material here, uh, but the material is is quite uh, flimsy and you know, hot and sweaty and dusty. <laughs> The problem is, and I hate to, you know, sound like a pig, but I mean, this movie doesn't really have what you come to these kinds of movies for. Uh, I'm thinking of like the archetypes, I think, for this are Mad Max, mostly because of the cars and, the, you know, the the weird souped up engines and the kind of the desert freaks who are harassing this uh, right. young woman who owns uh, an animal preserve out in, in the outback. And I spit on your grave. And a slew of the other kind yeah. of rape revenge fantasy, you know, movies that preceded this by at least 10 years. The problem is, you, you know, you've got this woman, she's out on her own. She's harassed by these three kind of, you know, uh, drunk, abusive, you know, yeah, yeah, losers. Um, and then they kind of, she fights back and, or she gives them a hard time and they decide to show her who's boss and, do kind of unspeakable like bits of harassment to her but it's still very tame i mean there's no the, nobody dies in this movie until it's almost over and mm -hmm. kind of the mark the mark of these kinds of films as unfortunate as it is is you've got like you know horrible violence sexual assaults like right. hairy situations all throughout that's what gives it that's what makes an exploitation film having all this stuff kind of show up in the last 20 minutes or five minutes doesn't quite cut it, especially if there's nothing else to hang your hat on except bad score, choppy editing and terrible direction. And that's, this movie is, that's what this thing is in spades. I mean, none of the, the, the lead actress, I mean, she, she's fine, but she doesn't have any particular charisma. Um, the, the three guys uh, who are kind of chasing her, they all just seem like cartoon characters. You know, you've yeah. got, uh, the mechanic, the kind of punk artist looking guy, and then straight up crocodile Dundee. And it just doesn't work. Yeah. Sparks played by Gary, who is exactly. the mechanic no. <laughs> Ringo. It looks like he's like, you know, a reject from, you know, like, like the, you know, beat it Michael Jackson video or something. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and then Sonny played by Peter Ford. Um, and and he's almost like at first, yeah. I mean, you almost see a hint of potential here because at first, when they come across the young woman who's uh, basically managing a animal sanctuary in the outback, um, and you know that's just not going to go well. Uh, but when they first meet each other, you know they're like kind of trying to run her off the road. They have a truck full of kangaroos that they just killed and they also have the the token trademark vehicle for this movie called the beast which looks like like totally ridiculous you know and and just souped up uh it's one of those like uh, souped up pickup trucks that have like you know a, a standing 
seat in the back for like whatever you know um yeah, for like the, the snipers, shooting the poachers yeah yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. so yeah they're they're and all sorts of like weird poachers. pipes and stuff coming out of the front it this it yeah. looks like you know in mad max like the post-apocalyptic mm -hmm. reality they kind of put these things together this looks like uh you know what if they hadn't waited for the apocalypse to put their apocalypse truck together but it doesn't work because it looks kind of like it looks dusty but it looks new like there's a nice red paint job and, and everything right. it that stuff needs to look weathered beaten and radioactive and this just looks silly yeah it, it looks like hey look what we did for this movie you know this is going to be the star of this movie it's like no. no um but yeah so like you said it is kind of kind of a cat and mouse game but it, you know initially there's a sliver of of, of a potential um something that could be somewhat character driven but of course it's not when when she does meet this sunny guy face to face in like this uh kind of like uh let's say a convenient market or the local you know grocer or whatever um they do have a little bit of somewhat flirty confrontation um you know but then you know she does the math and realizes that you know he's one of the he was with the kind of uh, caravan who tried to run her off and she's not having it, you know, and she's, she knows that they're poachers and hunters and she doesn't want to have anything to do with them. Um, and then from then on, it's, it's like, Oh, well, you're going to, you know, turn me off. We're going to have a little fun with you, you know, and it's just very eye rolling. And of course, conveniently her, either her husband or boyfriend is like out of town. We learn right. You know, like in the beginning of the movie, like, through a convenient phone call um so we know she's on her own um and you know at first she just tries to ignore them you know and of course you know that only instigates them even further and they start they start like trashing her, you know the sanctuary um and you know try and you know run her off again and again and it, it it gets so bad to the point where they capture her, stretch her over the beast, open up her, uh, you know, strip off her clothes. And she's then driven around in 360s, bare breasted, stretched out in the cover of the like, like Mad Max on Fury Road. And it's like, come on. Well, I mean, and that's what Tarantino was responding to in that yeah. documentary. He's like, who does that? I'm like, it is a great well, I'm going to say great, you know, as far as filmmaking, it's a really great moment, you know, outside of the context of the rest of this movie. If the rest of it had been as apeshit as that moment, if it had uh -huh. been more like Fury Road, yeah, then I think it would have really stood out as it stands by that. I was so checked out by this that when they were doing it, all I was thinking of yeah, this is reminding me of the uh, the scene in the Clockwork Orange where they're cutting the outfit right. off the, right. the, the the woman, um, and then they're they're driving her around and everything. But she, there's no like real consequence. To this there's all these little episodes, these vignettes of these attacks that happen, mm -hmm. and yet she always like winds up back at her house, <laughs> and then she wakes up. And then she goes out, and in a couple of cases, she goes out and tries to take these guys on on her own without like weapons or anything at one point they're harassing her horse i think at night yeah. by you know with their trucks and she's like hey you stop and they're like you gonna make us and they all surround her and then she's like oh shit and then she's like decides to run away i'm like what what did you think was going to happen in this situation you've already run afoul of these guys yeah there's another scene where she wakes up at her dinner table and she hears the rumbling of this truck and like all of her china is shaking in the cabinet around her and she's sitting there screaming and we cut to the truck at night there's all this like mist or smoke or something you see the guys in the truck and it's very clearly moving but we never get the relationship between where the truck is and where her house is yeah i have to imply that they're driving around her house or driving towards her house or something like that it's almost like two completely different scenes. She could have been frightened because there was a tornado outside. There's no, right. and we never see them drive through the house or drive up to it and get out. I have to imagine that they're doing donuts around her property or something. It's just, it's so terribly filmed. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, you know, of course there's, 
the, there's the what the filmmakers are trying to convey also is this idea of like the the hot Aussie temperature, the sun, it's it's sweaty and drenched. And of course we have to see her laying naked, you know, uh, you know, uh, on her stomach, on her bed, you know, with a fan on and oh, it's so hot, you know, and then we have to have a shower scene, you know, all these things. And it, it, it's just like, <laughs> but it's like you just i wonder it's like if the director is having a conversation and the screenwriter is having conversation with the actors saying like oh no it's it's, it's we're going to really uh convey the the heat of of the you know australian outback you know really what and, well but and that's that's key i think to one of the problems with this movie is you almost get the feeling like it's trying to be better than the movies that it's mimicking classier yeah. You know, the, the thing that makes, I think, great exploitation work is there's either an element of real eroticism to the nudity or there's you know a real sense of danger. And unfortunately, with a movie like I Spit on Your Grave, there's a lot of uh, we'll call it sexual danger involved in that movie. It's very right. unpleasant to watch, but it also makes that film in a lot of circles, you know, a brutal classic. Right. This it's just like, yeah, she's taking off her clothes to lay down and, you know, she's got the fan on or she's going to take a shower. Uh, there's there's just it's just flat. It's a, the whole tonally. This thing is a flat line until the very end when it shows, you know, when she starts offing these guys. Yeah. Fighting back. Yeah. And, you know, I think at that point, the movie gets a pulse, but it's way too late by then. Yeah, it just doesn't. uh <laughs> It does. It doesn't work out, and I feel bad for uh, you, you know, I don't know. I, the the actress is really you know working overtime here, you know. You know, the, I was reading up. Uh, you know, the IMDb trivia says that she uh, spent three months prepping for this picture. You know, a, a three month program of physical exercise, including jogging and gym workouts. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, okay, fine, you know, whatever. If she was um, like, you know, 300 pounds or something, I, I would see that as yeah, an inspiring but she, story. But she, like, what is she doing in this movie? <laughs> yeah, she's like 90, you know, 80 something pounds. Um, yeah, I, I, the stunt coordinator trained her in horseback riding and trick car driving. OK, I could see the horseback riding stuff. Fine. Uh, but yeah, I, I, honestly, there is just like kind of like a lot of running around you know, on her part and, you know, she is in shape and everything, but there's just got to be more to this movie than that. You know, I, I feel like there's, the, yeah, there's, like you said, there's really no sense of dread or, uh, you know, intense um, danger or, you know, threat other than, okay, here we go again. Now he's chasing her and, now she's coming back after them and it's it just yeah after a while like you said it, it just gets straight up boring and, and it's funny because you know i suggested this movie that we watch this movie just because like oh wild you know a, a supposed cult classic from down under and that took place smack dab in the middle of the 80s and how come i've never heard of this well here's why you know and it was it was never released in the u.s and so, you know, of course, somebody like Tarantino, who worked in a video store at the time, I'm sure he dug this up somehow and and just was I could see him, you know, cackling late at night, you know, closing the video store and, you know, oh, this is amazing, you know, but um, it's not QT. It's not amazing. And yeah, but you bring up an excellent point. I wonder how much of this of his enjoyment of it, because he'd seen by this point, I'm sure assuming he was watching a lot of movies from the 70s and the early 80s, by the time we get to 86, and the, the genre is almost on its way out um, in terms of Australian exploitation, uh, he'd seen way more out there stuff than this. So I wonder how much of his enjoyment was just that rarity factor, especially back in the days where if you found like an import mm -hmm. VHS or something, you could say, hey, I finally saw a fair game, you know, that, that Australian movie that came out a few years ago with a girl strapped to the front of the car you know, that thrill, and I can't speak to for him, but I have yeah. certainly succumbed to this myself. Sometimes the thrill of the thing of like finding it and discovering it 
shades your perception of what it actually is. Sure. I mean, we've all, I can't name it off, name one off the top of my head, but we've all finally caught up with a movie that everybody was raving about. And it's usually a deep cut somewhere that's, you know, it's hard to find and it's a cult classic and you finally catch up to it and you're like, mm, okay, you know, um, maybe just too much overhype. Um, in this one, in this case, this is, you know, something, <laughs> it's not too much overhype. Maybe, well, maybe by one person, but, you know, we never, we've, I, I've never heard of this before then. I mean, you t- you say fair game and I think of Cindy Crawford and uh, one of the Baldwin guys uh, from that, what, 96? Um, 95. Or, yeah, 95. 95. Yeah, the class, that's a classic right there. Uh, or, or what, Sean Penn and, and Naomi Watts was in a movie called Fair Game? Um, there was also this movie, which I was disappointed. This is Fair Game. <laughs> what is uh, that? It stars uh, Trudy Styler, yes, Mrs. Sting herself. Wow. Greg Henry with a special appearance by Bill Mosley. No way. Um, now it I'm is, interested. It's, we'll have to watch it sometime. I've only seen it once, but I had to have the DVD. It's wow. uh, about a woman who's trapped alone in her house with a killer snake. Uh, wow. Yeah, it will change your life. And I was hoping that, you know, you say Australian exploitation, I was hoping something on the level of, you know, batshit crazy as mm-hmm. this but it's such a tame it is film i it's it's really a puzzlement now i will say uh because i do want to talk about that that documentary yeah. unless there's something that sticks out to you about no, fair game no. that we need to talk about but no no towards the end when um was it ringo gets electrocuted you'd think it'd be <laughs> sparks but you know <laughs> but it's ringo i thought that was pretty effective yeah i i loved sunny's death scene because there's mm-hmm. a, a pretty effective chase where he's in the beast and he's running her down and she jumps. I think she jumps across a chasm or something because there's a dip in the, yeah, in the yeah. landscape and his vehicle essentially falls in and she is essentially sets the thing on fire. He's trapped inside. He gives this great prolonged. It's like a couple minutes long of realizing that he's screwed realizing he's about to get set on fire, getting set on fire and then burning just his agonized screaming and terror and rage. That was almost worth the price of admission to me. Almost. There's hints of the tone that this thing could have taken over the course of, you know, 90 minutes, but they just went in the complete opposite direction. And this punctuation doesn't add up to a riveting sentence. Yeah. I mean, that was, um, it, it was a good ending. Um, you know, there was the build to that ending again, like we were saying is just kind of a, a lull and a kind of flat line uh, as far as intensity is concerned. But um, yeah, I mean, the way that these guys are kind of off um, it, it honestly, they're, they're not very smart and it, it shouldn't take much to get rid of them. <laughs> They don't at any point really have the upper hand, um, you know, except when they manhandle her and strap her to the, you know, uh, the beast. But even then, I don't think that they really ever intended to say, like, kill her, Um, you know, uh, maybe just terrorize her, possibly rape her. Um, You know, that doesn't happen. Um, The rape. Uh, they do terrorize her but you know and and trash her place okay uh but um i guess one of the things that i liked about one of the few things i liked about this is that she basically saw it totally through you know and and that that she off these guys you know even though their intention wasn't to kill her she was just like that's it you know and it it wasn't like i wouldn't say it was like say vindictive on her part it was more of a survival thing and to you know basically rid herself and her animal sanctuary of these guys and and it it wound up being whatever it whatever it takes to get rid of these if it if it winds, it winds up being death then so be it well here's and maybe you can help fill me in because i might have been checking twitter or something when they explained <laughs> this to, what to me is kind of a big problem uh, you know what else could have gotten rid of these guys is the police. Now, I, I know early on 
there's a scene where she goes to like a friend or she knows somebody right. who's like a local authority and she's like yeah these guys were kind of giving me a hard time and he's like well you don't they didn't actually do anything and you don't have any evidence so what do you want me to do about yeah. it yeah what do you want me to do ah, ah. right by the time this movie's over she could have someone come out to her place and probably find evidence of some kind of, you know, harassment or, you know, whatever they've destroyed yeah. you know, parts of, they've at least driven around on her property. They can probably check the tire marks and there are, she's got a, she at various points, I think she's got a horse. She had some kind of a vehicle at one point. I think she could have walked there. Just, there's so much in other exploitation films, there is an element where, the heroine who is being harassed by the you know the the troublemakers is trapped yeah. like completely cut off from the rest of society and i didn't get that sense in this movie no what am i what am i missing well what what the movie's missing is is a lot i mean you know yes it would have been really nice i mean when you think about all that racket with the uh the gunfire uh explosions whatever um you would think that would catch somebody's attention. Uh, I, you know, I doubt she has any close neighbors, but I mean, come on. Um, y- you could, you could have had a scene where, you know, all right, just cause we're friends. I, I came out to check on you, you know, that guy that she talked to, you know, whatever, but you or know, a no- phone or like a CB nothing. radio or something. Yeah. I, I just don't feel like she's, she, I don't feel like she owns an animal sanctuary. If, if not even for herself, like what happens if one of her, you know, kangaroos has a stroke and has to be taken to a right. nearby vet or something like that? Like yeah. she's responsible for all these different lives. You'd think that she would have some kind of a lifeline to help if she needed it. Yeah. Not all of that was thought through at all. Um, and, you know, I, I think this was, let's see, it was written by Rob George, who you know, another, uh, I, again, it's all pure Australian. I think he was another guy during that time who was, yeah, he primarily known for documentaries. Um, uh, so yeah, again, I think it would be really interesting to know, like, uh, the more about the making of this movie than the actual, you know, movie that would be a bit more interesting. Um, that being said, you know, not quite Hollywood did kind of redeem Fair Game. Um, well, not the movie, but the experience of watching Fair Game. Uh, not quite Hollywood was, uh, was a far better uh, viewing experience uh, and educational experience because I had never heard of the term Ozploitation until I read a little bit about Fair Game and I'm like, wait, that's a thing. Um, and then when I Googled that, I found not, not quite Hollywood and it happened to be on Prime Video um so yeah uh this was written and directed by mark hartley um it's primarily looking at you know australian genre cinema in the 70s and 80s now of course when you think of australian cinema from the 70s think breaker morant you think picnic at hanging rock you think of these uh bruce beresford uh frank shipsippy uh, um uh peter weir movies uh george miller of course um but you know, those are all kind of like high art kind of movies. And those are mentioned here. And they and they basically said that if it wasn't for these schlock genre movies, you know, those high art movies wouldn't have, you know, you know, been on the map and, uh, globally. Um, OK, uh, you know, maybe um, I, I kind of want to believe a little bit of that, because I think that, you know, it's it's one of those things where, OK, say 10 Aust- Australian movies are made uh two of them are really good you know uh not that the other eight aren't entertaining it's just two of them are really good and and the rest are just like you know fun entertaining schlock um and like you said these are a lot of these movies are you know ones that we've never even heard of but you know now i'm i'm interested this kind of reminded me of like uh, of electric boogaloo in a way yeah um you know uh, where you know that talks about you know like the canon films uh this is something that yeah i didn't even know i mean some of those like sex comedies like are just like i mean they're basically soft porn um they're you know not showing any penetration but uh, certainly a lot of titillation <laughs> yeah it's 
it's a fascinating I, I love documentaries that are uh you know entertaining like art pieces in themselves mm -hmm. and that's definitely the case here you know you got a lot of splashy graphics a lot of fun uh edits um some really colorful characters for the talking heads um let's uh, let me see i'm trying to see oh, if i've got the yeah a graham here. blundell blundell who was in alvin purple um uh, they all kind of run together i'd have to like right. watch it again because it, it's but there is one character uh, he's a he's a he's a real life character named bob ellis who's a oh. film critic yeah who just looks like the most miserable son of a bitch you'd ever never want to meet and it's funny uh, because he never says anything good about these movies really no and that was what was refreshing to me is like you have a documentary that's celebrating these movies yet rarely in these kinds of movies do you ever have like uh screen time for critics who are just you know deriding these you know these types of movies and i thought that that was kind of like a refreshing kind of healthy balance there well it's also because you don't get the it, one of the kind of the undercurrents of this film is about the rise of exploitation in Australia and how it was kind right. of important to their their media industry, um, but also it kind of it resulted in a cultural backlash where there was resentment of you know kind of Americans coming over and making Australian style pictures or kind of like vice versa. There was this one uh, Jamie Lee Curtis, Stacy Keach movie which i have to see now i, I, mean, I need I, to see that road games road games yeah um and they were just talking about yeah you've got this american actress and you know jamie lee curtis came and stole that part from an australian actress and there's like this resentment i feel like bob ellis was kind of speaking to a lot of that throughout this movie he had a quote he said um i felt then as i do now that americans are scum and shouldn't be allowed near our money <laughs> i love it <laughs> and you know it, it i'm not gonna argue of, <laughs> well, but he reminded me of like a less pleasant version of Anton Ego from Ratatouille. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I could see that. Um, but yeah, there's just you see these movies. I've been on a big Italian horror, you know, genre kick for the last couple of years. And I think I finally found, you know, I might do that for another year or two and then just like rope the gang into saying, hey, we're going to go explore Ozploitation. That's right. Because there's, the sex comedies looked funny. Um, honestly, it's weird because I was so desensitized to the naked female form by the midpoint by this of this documentary, documentary. Yeah, it's. I'm like, you, you're gonna fall over when you hear me say this, ladies. Please put your clothes back on. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, and it, and it's funny because I was impressed and kind of surprised by the fact that the director actually got many of these ladies as talking heads in this documentary and most of them are like putting the putting their movies into context you know mm -hmm. and and they were like look at the time this was like you know kind of invigorating you know and we were all doing this you know you know and some of them are like totally embarrassed by what happened and what they did uh, I would say probably more so for the gratuitous horror movies than the sex comedies. Um, understandably so, because some of those horror movies looked really bad. And yeah. Um, but I've, but yeah, it's it's interesting. I've never seen The Howling 3, The Marsupials. Wow. But yeah, looking at the yeah, looking at the high definition, you know, because it's a really it was a 2008 documentary. So a lot of these things had really cleaned up the footage when they showed it. I was like, I, I, I can't imagine watching that, you know, when it came out and thinking this is uh, this is above, you know, um, even at par. Jesus. Oh, um, I, I was watching it. I was like, what is happening? There's like a pouch <laughs> and they're showing about how they they put like some kind of like a costume on a mouse, you know, and, and I'm like, oh, <laughs> What is they happening? Put a here? mouse in a fetus and a werewolf fetus costume. Um, yeah. Then they, another scene, they had uh, these rats crawling over this actress and they said, don't worry, it'll be OK. Um, <laughs> that, that kind of that gonzo spirit, I think, is, is all throughout this movie. But, you know, something struck me uh, talking about the, the female actresses kind of revisiting their roles. 
I wonder how this, how those interviews would go today. Cause this is 2008. This is, you know, mm-hmm. eight years before me too. Yeah. You know, it's, it is kind of a strange time capsule and it's strange to say that as a time capsule from something that's only like 14 years old, but right. You know, I, I hate to be the guy who says they couldn't make this documentary today. I just think it'd be very uh, differently received possibly. I think they could make it today, but I think they would include like, you know, I'm sure they would touch on these would never be made today. And I'm sure they would touch on me too and everything. Um, I don't, I just don't know if you would, it, it would definitely be a different film because Right. When you talk about the, the 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 guys, the male filmmakers who produced and directed these things, there's not a lot of sh- not not saying that they have anything to be ashamed of. You know, some of them might, but you know, just on its face, there's nothing wrong with making exploitation films as long as everybody knows what they're getting into. Mm-hmm. But you know, I feel like they would have there been would have been a lot more kind of atonement. Uh, or at least like acknowledgement that, yeah, this wasn't uh, that this doesn't look very good now. Yeah. I mean, some of these guys, none of them are, you know, embarrassed or, or have any kind of regret of what happened. It, you know, they're just all like, well, it was what it was and for the time, you know, this is what we did. And there's, there's almost a certain amount of, uh, you know, pride in what they did. Um, I, I, to an extent, I could understand that because they basically developed and established that whole niche in uh, Aussie Aussie films for the in that time in the seventies and eighties, and so uh, for them for for there to be a documentary of, of revolving around that, I mean, I'm sure there's it's, it's it, I'm sure they're you know feeling kind of good about themselves, uh, but. Yeah, even when we see, even though a lot of these movies that are mentioned, some of them that I've heard before, like Razorback, um, uh, a lot of the movies that are mentioned um, are are so, and, and again, I don't know if it's just because of the editing and what they show us, kind of like fair game. Some of them just seem like so interesting. You know, I, I went to try and look them up and you can't find them anywhere. You know, so it's like, man, I... It would be crazy if like, you know, some some place like, you know, Arrow Video or Vinegar Syndrome, you know, put together some type of a compilation or something of all these movies. Um, that would be interesting. Um, I remember the one that they mentioned of BMX Bandits. I'm sure you remember that from being With like Nicole Kidman. Nicole yeah. Kidman. Yeah. Yeah. And you could rent Razorback. That became kind of a, a huge thing in a no pun intended in. Yeah, from 84 about a vicious wild boar terrorizing the Australian outback. Okay. Um, with Gregory Harrison. That's hilarious. Um, <laughs> that other one, uh, Turkey Shoot, looks crazy. Um, in a dystopian future where deviants are held in re education camps, a freedom <laughs> fighter and a wrongfully accused prisoner form an alliance to survive their decadent oppressor's game of kill or be killed. <laughs> And turn the tide against them. I mean, that's most dangerous game right there, you know, basically. Um, so I, I love that they kind of take these established, you know, kind of storylines and then just went bonkers on them and, and for, you know, uh, threw in a lot more titillation or gratuitous this and that. Um, that that movie Next of Kin looks crazy, too. Um, yeah, it, it's just it's it's funny because some of these yeah that movie killer workout or what's what's that the the kung fu one looked crazy about oh. that whole was it the hands of kung fu or something the man from hong kong man from hong kong <laughs> and that's you know what i loved about that is they talked about who and i don't remember the actor's name but he was like the you know this sensation who came over to australia to make this movie and everybody despised him he was apparently yeah. like really arrogant and, and a hated jerk. white women <laughs> yes he, he thought like white women were terrible and white actresses were the worst. I'm like, Oh no. Oh yeah. Um, but it's just, uh, yeah, these kind of like what we were saying with, uh, with fair game, the stories behind these films are, you know, fascinating. I don't know if they, mm-hmm. if the movies themselves could live up to them, but I would definitely like to, to find out 
somehow. Um, I thought there was some really cool uh, stuff about the making of Mad Max and yeah. how, you know, George Miller, like just kind of went crazy. He was, a, they put it, he was a visionary, but he wasn't technical uh, at that point. So he really, they, they had to push, it was sort of like George Lucas, I imagine, with Star Wars, just, you know, trust me, I, I want to do this stuff big and crazy like that no one's ever seen before. He had a crew who's like, I, I guess we'll just try and pull this off. Um, and it's a miracle no one got killed on that set, although they do mention there are some other movies where people kind of yeah. died tragically. Yeah. Uh, there was this one movie with the uh, motorboats that Donald Pleasance was supposed to be in, oh, and they man. went out with a, a test run on the speedboat, and three people didn't come back because the the choppy waters. Was, was that just... the Death Cheaters? I don't know. I it... No, that was something else. Um, but yeah, just some, some fascinating stories and, you know, from the outside, you could think, oh, this is just going to be a bunch of people fanboying over, you know, sex movies and horror movies and stuff. But <laughs> this is a surprisingly deep film that I think helps you appreciate not only why people love genre films, but also the craft that goes into making genre films, even if at the time people just consider them to be schlock and, and write them off. Yeah. I mean, even, you know, it reminds me that, you know, even bad movies, you know, uh, I, I don't know, few and far between are there bad movies where everybody involved had a desire to make a bad movie. You know, it, it's, it's, it's the, the intention is like, let's, let's either have fun or let's do something ridiculous or let's just do something insane, you know, and, and a lot of times, most most of these movies are are insane, um, and they they just you know kind of like the old you know Spinal Tap saying they this one goes to eleven you know all these <laughs> movies go to eleven, um, and the one of the directors that stands out in this documentary is Brian Trenchard Smith, um, you know uh, Australian filmmaker who did like. Pre pre produced wrote directed all these like television and movies and you know quentin tarantino is like a huge fan of his and and i almost want to like i feel like it would be cool to like just you know grab a handful of his movies and just you know check them out if we could find them you know he's the one who directed bmx bandits uh, the aforementioned turkey shoot uh stunt rock which looked like, totally <laughs> crazy that that looked <laughs> I don't know, it's just like it's hard to believe that you know you, when you watch a movie like that you think like there are there are talented film school you know, you know students who are out there really trying to get their first movie made yet movies like this get made and it's just it what what fueled it a lot of you know drugs and alcohol and it's also has to do with a lot of the, the time and when this movie came out and when it was made because everything was just kind of a free-for-all well, and also there were, you know, they kind of touch on this, there were government arts grants so mm. that, you know, you could get, that's why there are so many of these damn pictures made yeah. and also why, <laughs> why they kind of stopped, you know, in the late eighties, because right. they're like, it's hard to justify. It, it was all, you know, grants based on uh, elevating Australian culture and heritage through the arts. Right. Uh, and so by the time you've got your 900th movie about like exploding monsters and vehicles crashing into each other with, driven by naked women, it's kind of hard to justify that. But it does speak to this idea that, you know, they didn't really speak to, there weren't like film schools and established institutions that people could go to. They just somehow got a hold of like camera equipment, like, screw it i'll go drive through that wall <laughs> and oh, we yeah. get ourselves a movie well speaking of grants there's that stuntman grant page that guy's nuts and mm -hmm. uh, you know there's got to be a documentary on him uh because he's he's in his 80s and he's still doing well he's well, what a lot of these guys do is they become stunt coordinators because right. you know they they're they don't have any more knees or shoulders or whatever. Um, <laughs> and they just roll them out and do stunt coordination. Uh, but um, yeah, I mean, the, this Grant Page guy, uh, I would say watch this documentary just for the, the bit about him because he's just kind of nuts, you know, and, you know, 
he is one of the talking heads and it's just kind of amazing i mean he's still alive to this day and that was in this documentary like you said was in 2008 but um yeah he did a lot of those uh, aussie films like you know he was in did stunts for mad max but you know looking at his imdb he also did stunts for like gods of egypt and the you know jason statham mechanic movies you know it's just like wow you know uh, of course at that point it was yeah, no, he did some performing for those too, not just coordination, but it's nuts, you know? Um, so, yeah, it does, you know, make you think about what all is involved in this and what all, not just that, but what all they can get away with then. Because, you know, they were saying it's like, it made me think of that uh, unfortunate situation with the Alec Baldwin Western, mm. you know, and you think about, you think about what happened there and then you think about what's happening on these sets um you know back then you know they don't they didn't have all these rules and all these you know uh, regulations and they were they were basically blowing off real live ammo and firearms on these actors yeah, shooting yeah shooting at actors i mean that's the thing is they it's it's a miracle that there weren't more and this movie doesn't get into it too much it does talk about a few incidents where people were, were hurt, but you know, you'd think with this history of this number of films coming out from this crazy of film culture, that there'd be way more stories of like maimings and deaths right. going on. Um, yeah. I, wow. That, that's a whole other movie. It did. This movie kind of reminded me of a film. I think we talked about a few years ago. Uh, was it stunt woman? Yeah. Um, yeah. That, that was really good. I, this, I think that and oddly, at least a section of this would make good kind of companion pieces. Yeah. Yeah, yeah totally. Um, very interesting. Um, again, it's always good to kind of uncover, um, uh, you know, certain aspects of, um, movie making, uh, from a different country, let alone all these, you know, hidden movies that even some of them, like you said, branched out and had kind of like name stars. I mean, that movie with Henry Silva looked hilarious. I got to, gotta, <laughs> what the heck? Um, well, that whole, yeah, the whole story about it, he was supposed to grab onto a helicopter yeah. as it was taking off and he refused because he was afraid of heights. They like, they rigged the helicopter feet onto a was, cherry picker. Right, right. And they're like, just grab onto that. But the thing is the cherry picker almost ended up going higher than the helicopter would have. <laughs> Unbelievable. Just, and you know, what I also loved was, uh, you know, you really get a sense for how these movies influenced films that would go on to be huge. They had James Wan and Lee Wan L. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is back when, you know, saw was kind of in its heyday, just about 2008 when they filmed this, um, they were talking about how Mad Max, <laughs> that scene with the, uh, with the hacksaw in the foot. I mean, that was one of Wan L's inspirations for saw, which became a, you know, billion dollar franchise or whatever Crazy. it is. Yeah, yeah. And the popularity of say like Wolf Creek was, you know, basically homage to those movies that they grew up on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, and that's that's the whole thing is it's kind of like Paramount back in the 80s with uh, the Friday the 13th franchise. They were embarrassed of those movies because they were just like, you know, TNA slasher horror, mm -hmm. but they made all the money. Like there was so much that Paramount was able to do because of these you know, dirty little uh, secret. Well, not so secrets, but, you know, these movies they they didn't like. Uh, but it's sort of the same thing here with uh, with Ozploitation in some kind of ways. Oh, yeah. And all you got to do, like with the Friday the 13th movies, all you got to do is, you know, find a way to make another one in the next two or three years. And in this case, with the Ozploitation stuff, it's like all they had to do is try and, you know, keep this momentum going. And, oh, Jaws is popular. Oh, we'll make up our own. Oh, you know, uh, the dinosaur movies. Oh, we'll make up our own or whatever, you know. Um, yeah. Well, and also there was a, a little bit of a thread, which again, could probably be its own documentary. They're talking about how the Italians began ripping off the <laughs> Australians you know, with their exploitation films, making like these weird se unofficial sequels to movies. Um, yeah, there's just, there's so much here. So I, I'm glad that I had to endure fair game right? so that I could be rewarded. It's like eating the liver and Brussels sprouts so you could have six hot fudge sundaes you know, afterwards yep reminds me of those golden nugget days even though we didn't have that mm. um yeah uh man yeah i mean 
no no mention at all of Vegemite sandwiches, but um, you know, <laughs> um, it, it, going back to Fair Game, it's just like it is funny how parts of that movie were edited to make it actually look good, and then to have that movie look be, be so bad. And I'm wondering if some of these movies that actually kind of look interesting and good will wind up kind of like I'm sure some of them are 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 just bad. Yeah, I mean, but that's the thing is like even in the the you know the, the really heightened i'll call it exploitative moments where you're seeing like heads exploding and you know lots mm. of crazy weird kinky sex that was at least more than we got in True. fair True. game there was yeah. no there's nothing really graphic or explicit that's why the whole thing from start to finish felt like very you know almost pg13 and i don't know unless this was your first exposure to australian cinema like if you'd never seen mad max maybe you're thrilled at like oh my god she's strapped to the front of this car she's in such danger uh you know it's hard to put your mindset into someone back in 1986 watching this but yeah. i feel like there's a whole lot of imports that you would have had to have overlooked or not seen in order to find this thing thrilling yeah i'm also just wondering like why is it being re-released now i, I don't know because like so, 300 people on Twitter wrote to Dark Sky and said, hey, right. would you put out fair game? Like millions of people want this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was re-released so we could have this conversation, this podcast. So Exactly. And for that, I thank you. Uh, <laughs> not you, David. I yeah. thank you as well. But I'm talking like the folks at Dark Sky. Yeah, um, thank you. But uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for recommending. It's funny because I knew you recommended this to me. I assumed that you'd already watched it. And that's no. why you were so excited. <laughs> and then when you messaged me on Facebook, you're like, it's not that good. I'm like, do you still want to talk about it? Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> I'm sure we can find something to talk about. I mean, that, that's the thing is I'm always trying to find something that, you know, maybe you and I have not seen, you know, something that we is just off the beaten path and something we could discuss. Uh, good or bad, you know, it's it's you know you got to watch something like this to kind of balance out our our cinema palette to to get us a, a whole well-rounded view of what cinema could be about you know right. so yeah and, but i'm also again glad that we got to talk about uh not quite hollywood yeah i feel like i feel like the fair game conversation is 20 minutes max because we spent a good time portion of that talking about it in relation to other things in not quite Hollywood. True. Um, so yeah, this is, this is a happy accident and uh, yeah, I'm ready to, <laughs> to take the shrimp off the Barbie because I think it's pretty well cooked. Mm -mm. Did that work? No, I, not really. I, I, that had to come up at some point. Yeah. At least I didn't say it in a, in a bad Aussie accent. Crikey. Oh. Yeah, you had to do it. Anyway, <laughs> David Fowley of Keeping Real, thank you again for, for joining me and, and talking about this movie. Folks, check out David's stuff at Keeping It Real. That's R-E-E-L. Um, and if you like this show, please like it, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel um, and all that good stuff. And David, I think tonight when this is going up, um, you're going to be participating in a Thor Love and Thunder roundtable. Is that right? I'll, I'll, try, and, I'll try and bring both. The love, love and, and the thunder. thunder. Yeah, yeah. I'll definitely bring the and. <laughs> oh, <laughs> there you go. That's now. Is it an and or is it an ampersand? I don't know. No, no, the and. Oh, okay, cool. You're yeah. going full blown and. That's right. Um, yeah, I'll I'll be uh, popping into intro it, but I'm sticking to my moratorium on comic book movies, so I'm going to rely on you to keep the ship afloat, sir. I will do my best as long as you'll have me. All right, cool, man. Thanks, and uh, we'll talk about something else soon. All right. <laughs> Take Thanks. care. Bye. Bye.